Okay. Um, well, let, we'll get started here. Um, I uh, want to first off thank uh, Dr. Hampson and, and UCSF for the opportunity to to talk a little bit today uh, about a topic I think is extremely important for so really any any kind of urology you go into or practice, and that's radiation-induced complications of lower urinary tract symptoms. Uh, so lower urinary tract. This is primarily going to be around prostate radiation and um, the complications we see from that. So no disclosures. You know, this is a, this is, this is a sort of an unfortunate, excuse me, this is an unfortunate and, and common thing that we see. A gentleman who has a, a constellation of problems. He's got a, a bulbomembranous urethral stricture. So this is sort of the proximal bulb extending into the membrane. So you can see that he has these brachytherapy seeds. He's got a big problem here with a rectourethral fistula. And when you scope him, you know, the tissues look just positively uh, terrible. Uh, they're white and uh, there's extensive fibrosis. So, I, you know, I think one of the threads throughout the whole talk is that while radiation is an effective modality to help our patients uh, defeat their cancers, treat their cancers, it, it certainly is the gift that keeps on giving. And as the urologist, we're going to be seeing a lot of complications far after the therapy uh, that we're going to be tasked with taking care of. Radiation gives a number of uh, works through a number of interrelated mechanisms resulting in cell death. And essentially, in a simplistic view, the body's working to heal all this damage. And that's what leads to the problems that we see one, two, three decades after the initial therapy. And that this includes neovascularization in the bladder that leads to radiation cystitis, fibrosis that will lead to urethral strictures, periprostatic nerve damage leading to erectile dysfunction, et cetera. So just to give you an idea of, you know, as a reconstructive urologist, what we'd see over a year, we did, this is from our, our series, uh, about 140 patients had surgery who had complications from prostate cancer therapies. And half of them had had a radical prostatectomy and half of them had had radiation therapy. You know, the, the most interesting thing is that the patients that had the radiation therapy, um, these are patients that present with the, th the therapy having preceded the problem by many years. Whereas, you know, up front, all the complications related to a radical prostatectomy are going to be present, whether that be erectile dysfunction, incontinence, et cetera. Whereas with each decade, the cumulative consequences of the radiation uh, bear out. But you, you see across, across everything, um, urinary incontinence, fistula, bladder neck contracture, urethral stenosis. Most commonly, uh, you're going to see fistula uh, related to radiation therapy, but you also see it related to prostatectomy. This is an even better way to look at it. This is a really nice study from Sean Elliott's group at the University of Minnesota, and they use SEER Medicare data to look at long-term adverse events following prostate cancer therapies. And the, the, the two things, one is the, the prevalence of adverse 
urinary events is most common when you have people that have multiple, get multiple therapies. And in particular, those that get a radical prostatectomy and then get radiation therapy on top of that. But one thing to notice is that these curves, the slopes of all the radiation lines are very similar, as opposed to this surgery line that has a much flatter curve. And we very commonly see our radiation complications between 10 and 20 years after the radiotherapy. So my guess is if we followed these lines out to this next decade, we'd see a certain continued flattening of the RP curve and uh, potential rise in the radiation curves. Now, uh, you see all of the different complications that we're gonna talk about, LUTs, incontinence, stricture, uh, across all groups, um, but you certainly see really anything you see in an RP group, it gets worse when you add radiation. And then there are certain things that you see more frequently in the radiation groups. Um, I had to share, this is, this is funny. If you, of course, if you have patients that have overactive bladder, that have urgency, urge incontinence, or stress urinary incontinence, traveling is a logistic nightmare and actually quite stressful. Um, but <laughs> so these, these two folks definitely have had effective therapies. This is a really nice um, case series from Japan, about 900 patients who underwent brachytherapy. And, um, you know, this is a real classic thing. At one to three months, there's the most prominent LUTs. This is the time when they're going to give a steroid taper. They're going to uh, give Flomax. And, and, but you, you see typically by, by two years that we get a regression to the mean. And then uh, this continues uh, over a five-year period. Uh, they very nicely phenotyped people with objective measures. So we see the Qmax. We see the post-void residual and the voided volume in all of these numbers. Again, there's this initial dip when there's the, that prominent inflammatory reaction uh, with the tissue and the radiation, and then uh, things calm down. Now, in general, uh, lower urinary tract symptoms seen after radiotherapy are managed very similar to how you would in a diabetic or uh, someone who has them just based on aging. It, it is important to be very judicious with the use of things like TERPs or HOLAPs in these patients as the rates of incontinence are certainly higher than in the average person, uh, primarily because the sphincters are likely to be fibrotic and not as dynamic uh, in the, as in a non-radiated patient. So uh, what goes hand in hand with lower urinary tract symptoms? Uh, that would be erectile dysfunction. And I, I think that there is a misconception that erectile dysfunction is not somehow associated with cancer therapy uh, done through radiation. And, and that's, that's just not true. Uh, we looked at around 27,000 patients uh, with different kinds of radiation therapy and, and you know, by five years, about half had had de novo uh, erectile dysfunction. Um, the most, uh, the most uh, strong risk factor was multimodal therapy. So, you know, I think you know, many would say this, those kind of things are unavoidable, uh, but nonetheless, I think uh, this is, these, are, these are things that we can warn our patients up front. And uh, radiation therapy typically doesn't make the treatment of erectile dysfunction uh, any diff more difficult or different. Uh, it's you know, a ladder approach using medical management um, followed by surgery in, in refractory cases. So 
So moving on to another uh, sequela of radiation therapy for prostate cancer, it's radiation cystitis. And as bad as this is for the urologist, it's, it's even worse for the patient, um, especially when it becomes recurrent and recalcitrant. Um, but this, these are, you know, cystoscopic view uh, where you see these very fine, very delicate. The, the guy lifts up a grandchild, he has a bowel movement, and he gets bleeding every day. Um, and then, of course, this is the gross specimen where he's had to have his bladder removed. I think, um, again, secondary malignancies are a uh, consequence of radiation in some men. And so ruling that out is gonna be critical. Um, typically you're gonna start with conservative measures, catheter, irrigation, hydration. Um, you know, we would then go to cystoscopy, fulguration, um, staging, uh, making sure there's no reflux before considering going on to intravesical agents. I think more and more at the first signs of believing complications from radiation therapy, we're offering hyperbaric oxygen therapy. I'll tell you a little more about the data there. And then last resort are, are things like uh, selective embolizations or cystectomy. Th this is just to show that the response rate is uh, moderate for uh, intravesical agents. Uh, they do carry, they can carry significant risk, including uh, severe urinary symptoms. It's, it's good to know that the most dilute formulin uh, will lead to the fewest long-term sequelae. So this is, this is what the oxygen um, therapy tanks look like. Uh, there's walk-in models, and then uh, I think more modern are these ones that uh, you, you lie down in, you watch TV. Um, and, you know, they're not without risks. You can have uh, damage to your hearing or to your vision. And so it's important that patients are monitored. But, uh, you know, on, on balance, uh, many believe uh, that it has value. Uh, this is a meta-analysis. And again, these, so these are case series. Um, but there is an 84% uh, complete or partial resolution of hematuria with the therapy. Interesting to look at these, these series and note that uh, the time between when you got your radiotherapy to when you had bleeding is anywhere between two to five years that, um, you know, don't expect to be done. If you have resolution, it very well may come back and it may come back quickly. Um, so you see the relapse rates, you know, 20 to 30%. This is the strongest evidence to support the use of hyperbaric oxygen for bleeding complications. It's a really nice randomized trial from Lancet Oncology uh, coming out of Europe where they had two outcome measures. One was to use a EPIC prom of lower urinary tract symptoms. So, you know, subjective, how's the patient feel? But then they also scoped the patients and used this validated score of how uh, much radiation damage was present, looking at things like active bleeding, neovascularization, et cetera. And, and you can see that here's the intervention group that got the radiotherapy, that got the hyperbaric oxygen. There's a considerable amount of improvement compared to the standard group. And then when they looked cystoscopically, again, uh, a lot of change and improvement compared to the standard care group. So we offer radiation patients that have bleeding complications, hyperbaric oxygen therapy upfront and um, 
uh, believe in its use. So th this is this is a panel of, of patients this is taken from a paper written by Dr. Hoffer and uh, Gonzalez about radiation-induced urethral strictures. And, and all three of these are in the bubble membranous uh, section of the urethra. So you can kind of see here's two patients with brachytherapy seeds. <clears throat> These seeds do appear to be outside of sort of their appropriate field. Uh, and not uncommon for us to do a urethroplasty on a patient like this, and we pull out little seeds. Um, we'll note that using a scope here is helpful because it really delineates exactly where your stenosis is. It's often hard to see based on a, a rug or VCUG where the stenosis is relative to other structures. So again, how does this happen? There's the trauma that, of the radiation that, uh, again, it kills cancer, but there is some fallout and collateral damage. Subsequent inflammation, fibroblast recruitment with myoblast production, and then fibrosis. How often does this happen? So this is, again, this is about 15,000 or 16,000 patients from trials uh, of radiation therapy. And we see when it's dual therapy, about 5% are gonna develop a urethral stricture. Brachytherapy, 2%, external beam, 1.5%, all groups, 2.2%. However, the problem with this study um, is that follow-up is very short in these studies. And I know, and, and we know from experience that the majority of these strictures show up at five to 15 to 20 years after the fact. So really, I think if you follow these patients out a little longer term, you, you get a better sense for what's, uh, what's a bigger problem. Again, the most common site for this stricture to happen is at the membranous urethra or bulbo membranous urethra, but it can happen all throughout. And um, that's, that's important to know. And again, similar to erectile dysfunction, when you have uh, people that have required multiple interventions of radiation, they're more likely to develop a urethral stricture. In, in addition, the longer that the patient is, was followed up in this meta-analysis, the longer they were, uh, the more likely they were to report a urethral structure. So uh, how is this thing treated? This is our series from UCSF and a number of, of fine institutions and, and um, clinicians have reported their really successful experience. So, because it's radiated, doesn't shouldn't scare you off from doing your urethroplasty to fix these. I will say that, at least in my practice, I am not as aggressive as I was at the very when I first started, and that's because of I, I what I perceive as a slightly higher recurrence rate, also some complications like incontinence. Um, but there's absolutely still a place for these in the right patient. Um, so we were able to employ mostly anastomotic urethroplasty. Now we're doing a non-transecting approach, which I'll describe for you. Uh, I, no problem if the stricture extends more into the bulbar urethra or, or pendulous urethra to use a, a substitution urethroplasty with buffalo graft. It works just fine. This is um, an example of a technique that many of us are using, and um, they're very nice for these posterior strictures, even in radiated cases with, uh, where you need to excise some tissue. Uh, it's a non-transecting urethroplasty. So the, the bulb uh, and the bulbar arteries are preserved. Although in radiated patients, a lot of times the, the bulbar vasculature is um, uh, somewhat uh, altered. But you you basically uh, do a Heineke Michelitz where you longitudinally incise. So this is the corpus spongiosum. These are the erectile bodies. This is the crust. This is going to be where your membranous 
urethra is, there'll be these muscle fibers in the radiated cases. It's going to be pretty fused, but you'll be able to peel this off, make a longitudinal incision, and then close it kind of Heineke Mikulit style. This is another um, complication. This one I would be a little more dreaded, uh, but again, you see a patient with avoiding cystourethrogram and the rectum filling out. So this is someone that has a rectourethral fistula, unfortunately. This is a series of really four legends in urology, Dr. Mackinich, Professor Mundy from London, Dr. Zinman from Leahy, Dr. Jordan from East Virginia, and uh, some of their protégés, where we wrote up their experience treating uh, rectourethral fistula. And, and it's, a, it's a neat series, and I think certainly something to learn from. But of all comers that were seen and treated and repaired, about half were RP, half were radiated. Interesting, it's not you don't always have to do a bowel diversion. Look, 35% of the RP group had no bowel diversion. 17% of the their radiotherapy group. Almost everyone got some type of interposition. And that's because it's really easy to do, whether that be uh, some dartos tissue, some perirectal tissue, most commonly a gracilis flap, or if you're doing it robotic, you can use omentum or a preperitoneal flap. That's an easy thing to do. And of course, separating the two canals and putting some healthy tissue in between, you know, just always seems like a good idea. Uh, buccal mucosa graft, now that's used exclusively in these radiated patients that have a, a large fixed defect. And so you, you patch it with uh, buccal mucosa and you can then quilt that mucosa onto a gracilis flap that you rotate in there and that works really nicely. Radiation patients are more likely to have a concurrent stricture. They're more likely to, to start off incontinent. And that's, that's often because you know, the prostate essentially is melted away in, as with their sphincters. Uh, sometimes we have to do these with a sphincter um, and uh, complications are about twice as likely in the uh, radiotherapy group. Most commonly, uh, again, Similar theme, when we have to give radiation on top of radiation, uh, it, it, those are the patients that are the highest risk for these types of very severe and, and devastating complications. So, you know, what do you, you know, this is, these are four really experienced surgeons. Uh, what do their successes look like? Well, in the radiated group, about a 80% success for first time of those failures, they're able to get a num you know, another uh, group fixed. And then the remainder here, this last 14, they had to have some type of diversion. <laughs> As opposed to over here in the RP alone group, no radiation therapy, you know, you're approaching 99%. So it's extremely unusual to have to get a diversion if you haven't had radiation therapy. It's not completely um, uh, rare in the radiated group. And, you know, these are people that they chose to fix. Now, I think they were probably pretty liberal and aggressive with fixing these, but uh, we've all come across patients that the cavity is so big, baseball sized, and, you know, it's basically like a big cloaca, they just can't be repaired. Um, and so in those, those patients, you know, typically just do a, uh, cystectomy, and then whatever diversion they prefer. This is another um, sequela of radiation therapy. And this one often happens in a guy that has stenosis after radiotherapy, and there's repeated interventions to try to help him. And what can happen is that they get fistulization. Usually it's anterior to the pubis, and you subsequently get just adductor irritation, debilitating pain, osteitis pubis, and uh, osteomyelitis. 
these, these can be really debilitating and um, there, there's a spectrum of them, but you typically will start with antibiotic therapy, stage them with an MRI, and we like to do, we also like to do a retrograde and scope them. And then based on that, determine whether you're gonna fix them. This is uh, data from the, the Turns group, which is a, a group of uh, reconstructive urologists across North America. And we, can, we, we looked at our patients that had this problem and um, you can see uh, of people that we saw, 12 were, we were able to repair primarily and preserve the bladder, whereas 19, uh, we were, had to do a cystectomy. And across all of these different things, they're pretty similar. These type of fistulas always are preceded by some type of endoscopic uh, intervention that, that leads to it. We have this little, algorithm that I, I think is helpful and sort of the, the, the money is right here. Does the patient have a stricture? Are they incontinent? Is, you know, are they a, uh, a bladder cripple? Is the bladder, can the bladder be rehabilitated? Is the bladder normal? And, and how, how sick are they? Um, you know, depending on this, if any of the above, so if they're free of these things, we'll, we'll go for repair. But if they have any of these things, then you really need to have a careful conversation with the patient and um, let them know your concerns. Because look, if you, fix, if you fix a fistula, but the person is incontinent and have a, has a 30 cc or 100 cc bladder, it's not gonna make any sense to put a, a, a sphincter in them they'll be miserable. So you kind of have to take the, all those things in to get together when you're uh, counseling somebody. This is a, a very nice uh, series showing what urinary diversion for severe adverse events after prostate radiation looks like. This is from uh, Jeremy Myers, led this uh, in collaboration with two research collaboratives, the uh, Enbridge Group and then Turns. And, um, you know, I think it's important to look at who these patients are. Again, most commonly, these patients had uh, combined therapy. And um, the reasons to do this intractable incontinence, meaning they've gone through all the sphincters you can do stricture, bladder neck that's just not fixable, um, fistula, abscess, hemorrhagic cystitis, and uh, just bladder necrosis. All, all of those strong indications. Um, and when you think about is it, is it urethra, is it bladder, is it both? Um, less likely to be bladder, more likely to be urethra or outlet um, versus uh, uh, urethra, bladder, and outlet. Um, you know, the punchline of this paper was that these are patients that are probably pretty sick to begin with and are prone to complications, even in experienced hands. And so, uh, again, high-grade clavian short-term complications, um, you know, high rates of readmission. Um, this is, so I, I, early in my experience, I, I did some patients like this and, and left the bladder in situ and then had problems afterwards with bleeding. And um, after, this is a very nice paper from the Michigan group where they do a simple cystectomy. And I can tell you that this is, this is really a nice way to do it. And you can do the cystectomy very, very quickly, you know, 10, 20 minutes. You essentially, you take a, a ligature, you bivalve, and then you take these leaflets off. This leaves a uh, sort of the, the bladder neck area that you can then fulgurate with cautery or, or argon, whatever you have at your disposal. Uh, but that works quite nicely. 
So um, in total, um, you know, to wrap things up, you know, radiation impacts all of the lower urinary tract um, and the, 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 the main difference with surgery is that you are going to get complications that happen well beyond the initial therapy. The patient's not going to be aware that that complication was a possibility and, and they're really not going to understand that radiation caused it. Um, it's also, um, again, these are harder to treat than the surgical complications. Uh, the patients tend to be sicker, but especially in experienced hands, uh, they are very highly treatable and uh, the patients tend to do well. So I want to thank uh, everybody, uh, thank the organizers, uh, my partner, Dr. Hampson and all of the education team. Um, and I'm supposed to share this. So what do you think about today's lecture? Share your thoughts by taking the survey. Um, please, please be gentle. No, I'm kidding. Uh, and I will open it up for questions. I'll stop my share. Okay. All right. So looks like there are a couple of questions here. Or one. Okay. So Ivan had a question, which was can Proton beam therapy replace radiotherapy. Will it reduce the number of lower urinary tract side effects caused by radiotherapy? Is there any evidence about proton beam therapy effectiveness as a combination therapy or as a single therapy? Th this is a great question. And to be, to be honest with you, Ivan, I am, I'm really not an expert in, in the effectiveness of these as primary cancer therapies. So I can't really speak to that. You know, I, I do think that um, there is always enthusiasm about the therapies as they emerge. And the challenge for us as reconstructive urologists is that we don't really see the side effects until, again, years later. And so, You know, I think clearly if the therapy is more targeted, that's going to lead to fewer uh, sequela. You know, we see these, for example, these brachytherapy seeds that are, you know, placed practically in the, in the mid bulbar urethra and these kind of things. So if the therapy can be more directed, that that would be uh, a benefit for sure. Any other questions? Ms. Cruz? All right, Dr. Breyer, I think that's all that we have for today for the questions. Thank you so much for speaking with us and I hope you have a great night. Have a great day. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Thank you.